Let us begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of my very favorite newer musicals is Avenue Q. It's sometimes a bit coarse and even borders on lewd, so I'm not going to repeat any of the lyrics. Um, but as things have a way, uh, it has such a wealth of deeper meanings that I try to overlook some of the body nature of it to see the universal human truths that are within. And one of these truths that I like so much is the need for individuals to find themselves and more pointedly, find their purpose in life. Princeton, a very appropriately named lead character in Avenue Q, is fresh from college. And he has moved into his first apartment uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, as you might guess, on Avenue Q. He involves his neighbors on the street and in his apartment building in an epic quest to find his purpose in life. Do any of you remember that moment in your life where you were still bright and uh, eager and fresh, uh, what do they say, wet behind the ears a little bit, and you knew that God had something in store for you and all you had to do was figure it out, and then the rest was easy sailing. Well, if you're like me, it's a constant journey to try and find my purpose in life, and just when I think I've got it, uh, I either lose it, or another better purpose comes along. Well, that happens a little bit with Princeton. What I take most delight in is that Princeton spends almost his entire time in the musical trying to find his individual purpose in life in the midst of community. Nothing he does is done apart from the people around him. And in fact, everything he does, he comes to find out, affects someone in his network. No person is an island unto themselves, John Dunn famously said once. Whatever he does affects someone else even if he doesn't realize he is affecting their life. Even at the end of the show where you think Princeton would have it all figured out, he still doesn't have a clue how his search for his own reason for existence is wrapped around the lives and heart of Kate Monster and Rod and Nikki and Brian and Lucy and Trekkie Monster and even Gary Coleman, who is a character in this musical. Luckily, they don't seem to mind that Princeton hasn't got it figured out, even at the end, because they and the audience love Princeton nonetheless and want to journey with him on this quest to find his individual purpose in life. From the classic expedition of Homer in the Odyssey to Luke Skywalker in Star Wars to the lives of everyday people like you and like me, we are all on a search to find ourselves as if somehow ourselves could be lost and somehow find our purpose in life if somehow living life wasn't purpose enough. And one of the great divides in our thinking, I dare say, is a divide as to whether or not we build our lives as solitary, heroic pioneers driven by such a 
deep sense of personhood and self that we ferociously struggle to create our world alone? Kind of the pull yourselves up by the bootstraps kind of uh, pioneer mentality? Or do we find our purpose in life enmeshed with others around us, embedded in a fabric of persons, places, and things, things long gone, present still, and yet to be? Just this past month, David Brooks, the conservative columnist for the New York Times, um, had a pretty powerful uh, article in the New York Times, and he reflected on this very uh, great divide I am talking about, the difference between, and he was pointing out, the difference he saw between the two national political conventions that happened, the two parties at the helm of American politics. He wrote that the one voice in the first convention that seemed to bridge the great gulf between what he called this hyper-individualistic mentality, in other words, uh, I can do it all on my own, I've got to find my own purpose all by myself, I can do it, what he called a ferocious commercial energy to find oneself, and the alternative that relies on more government, and what he called that creaky middle-aged group of American institutions. He said that the one voice that he felt that bridged the great divide was that of Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice, of course, was a former, um, what are those days? A former uh, uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense? State. State, State. Secretary of State. Um, and he said that her speech was this amazing, uh, powerful um, uh, call for us to live somewhere in between, which is what I'm calling us today is community. Um, Brooks celebrated her speech because in his words, the powerful words in her speech were not I and me, the heroic individual, but we and us as citizens who emerge out of and exist as participants in this great national project. Brooks went on to say that he took delight in Rice's speech because she subtly emphasized how our individual destinies are dependent upon the social fabric and upon public institutions like schools, just laws, and our mission in the world. She put less emphasis on commerce and more emphasis on citizenship, Brooks said. What the former Secretary of State was supporting and what Brooks was celebrating was community. Community. And community is not only a concept that's imbued in our nation story, but it's integral to our faith story. From the very first moments of creation, God sought community. When the opening chapters of Genesis began, God began to create things out of the void. And within a day or two of light and darkness, sea and land, God could not help the divine self but start creating community. So, God said, let there be, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the dome of the sky. So God created all the sea monsters and every living creature that moves, of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And if that wasn't good enough, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all the wild animals on the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind, human community in God's image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And they did. And we're here. The second telling of the creation story that begins in chapter 2 has Adam, the earth creature, in need of company. God declared, it is not good for Adam to be alone. And thus God created from one, two, Ishya and Ish. But the craving for community did not end there. From the twelve sons of Jacob, who bring us the twelve tribes of the Hebrew people, Jacob and his two wives, Leah and Rachel, and the female slaves, Bilhah and Zilpah. Twelve tribes of Israel were formed. Communities of communities were formed. The enslaved Israelites in the land of Egypt wandered in the desert absolutely dependent upon the communities that had been formed and upon their tribal identities and support systems. And the Hebrew scriptures are filled with judges and kings called to lead the peoples, to organize them, and to help these communities to survive, especially under very extreme circumstances. And then Jesus, unlike John the Baptist, Jesus was not content as a lone voice in the wilderness. He gathered a ragtag band of disciples around him to guide the faith into a blossoming and universal church. And the apostles who followed, such as Peter and Paul and Timothy, Lydia, Dorca, Phoebe and Barnabas, call us to live in community and live out community in order for the good news of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ that it might spread to the ends of the earth so that more and more people might give thanksgiving to the glory of God. But this community isn't just any old community. This community isn't just a gathering of people who happen to show up. This Christ-blessed community, this community about which all creation gathered, around which the entirety of Scripture is shaped, and which Jesus' ministry was built upon and the Apostles' message was formed, is a community that is intentional, sacrificial, and complete, thorough, through to the bone, you might say. This is what the writer of Philippians 2 is trying to get through to us. If then there is any agreement, encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you as was in Christ Jesus our Lord, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the kind of community that we are called to. This kind of community is intentional. It is intentional because it takes our full human intention to make it happen. Now, I believe that we have community built into our bones. I think we have the sense and need for community and the ability to create it innate in us. So 
So I'm not one of those people that believes that, that we are natural lone wolves. I believe we need community. But I believe there are so many factors in society and the world around us that we can't hear our communal heart beating loudly enough to be able to follow it. So creating and finding and sustaining and nurturing community takes all the things that we resist in life. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes patience. And it especially takes a willingness to go at it again and again, even when community fails us. And it will. The Apostle gives us imperatives in Philippians 2. Did you hear those? Which is to say, the Apostle gives us commands to be intentional about community. Be of the same mind. Be. Be in full accord. Be. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do. Regard others as better yourself, better than yourselves. Regard. Let the same mind be within you. Let. So community has to be intentional for it to be Christ. -like. Similarly, community must be sacrificial. This is really hard, but it is the essence of what Christ called us to and what Philippians 2 makes it very clear. Community is going to require something from us. It's not going to be something that's going to be laid in our lap, like some entitlement. It's not going to be something that's going to kind of uh, uh, appear like Brigadoon out of nowhere. In order to get the benefits of community, we must give of ourselves. That's the great cycle of life. There is no, if there's no such thing as a free meal in this world, there's definitely no such thing as a free community. The very first gathering that we can call church in the New Testament, and we talked about this earlier this summer, in the book of Acts, they gave everything they had so that none would be in need. But it's not just material things I'm talking about that we need to give. It's goodwill. Goodwill. Our hearts need to be given in order for community to be built. We have to give up our very lives to be in community. In the way in which Christ was in community. And in which Christ calls us to community. The words here are powerful. Christ emptied himself. You know those moments when you feel empty and you say to someone, I don't know how I can go on because I just feel so empty. That's at the moment that you may be most Christ-like. For Christ is calling us to empty ourselves into community. He humbled himself, even to the point of obedience, death on a cross. I almost didn't let this part of the scripture stay in there, because I know it's just too much to ask. And I don't really understand what it means for Christ to call us to give ourselves over to death like he did, in order to be in community, especially when we're in community with people who don't give a flip about who we are and what we want and what we do. Christ doesn't put any of those um, disclaimers on it. It's simply Christ humbled himself to the point of death. And? Finally, this kind of community is complete. It isn't simply sustained until we get outside the church walls and then it's like, oh, I cannot welcome any more of God's children anymore. Woo, I did it. You know, Franklin Circle pushes all my buttons. I'll welcome all God's children around that table that Colleen talked about. But once I get outside and away from seeing the table, no way. And it's not the kind of community that's sustained, if you listen to Pastor Allen much, beyond the parking lot. Oh, he doesn't want us to talk about things in the parking lot like other churches do. So I'll wait till we drive him home and then, <laughs> then I'll let go of community and tell what I really think about the church. Oh my God, did you hear that today? No. Complete. Complete. Christ is calling us to a complete understanding of community. It has to be something that you are, I am, we do 24-7, 365. 
It's something that we can't just do all the time somewhat. We have to do it passionately. If my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave up his life so that this community we call church could flourish on the earth, what am I called to do? Give him chopped liver back in return? The apostle invites us simply. I just love this phrase almost out of all scripture. Make my joy complete. And we do that by living in Christian community. And this is exactly why I've invited us to be part of this 40 days of community. I believe that for the first time since I arrived 11 and a half years ago, that there is this amazing and generally understood notion of community in this congregation. Now, I'm not saying that there never were times in the 170 years of this church's history that there wasn't a sense of this, of, of this kind of Christian community. I'm not saying that. I'm also not saying that it hasn't existed in some way, shape, or form since I've been here, but it feels like it was fleeting, or there's only a group of persons, or, or a person here or there that really understood this kind of intentional, sacrificial, and complete understanding of community. But in the last year, I have felt that something has changed. And even those folks who might not be on board 100% with one or another aspect of our mission still understand that they're going to stay at the table because it's how we do community as Christ called us to do community. For the first time, my heart has a sense that most of us get it. And me too. Kind of, kind of like saying that maybe there are a few more Princeton, a few less Princetons in our congregation who can't see the loving, grace-filled, caring community beyond our highly individualized nose, and more and more Christs in our community who are. So if we get it in some way, shape, or form, you ask yourself, why, Pastor Allen, do we have to talk about it? If we get it, shouldn't we just go ahead and live it? I'm highly aware of the temptation referenced in Bruno Bettelheim's quote here when he wrote, Community is viable if it is the outgrowth of a deep involvement in a purpose which is other than or above that of being community. What he's saying, you can't make community. You can't force community. It has to happen within you. So the seven weeks I'm inviting you all to be a part of is really a celebration of what already is happening in you and in me and in this congregation. It's also happening, I believe, at the same time in the community around us, known alternatively as Ohio City or the Near West Side, or even I think it's happening in Cleveland. What I hope we will get from this is not a bunch of talk about community, but a recognition of all the places that community is happening and more to the point that we connect the dots of community. Um, I think community is happening here at Franklin Circle Christian Church, and I so want it to continue to happen, but more importantly, to be leavened in the loaf, to spread so that our neighbors see that and feel that. Um, and if you believe in this also, I'm asking you to invest in this process in three ways. Number one, I believe being a part of 40 days of community will awaken those instincts of community which you already have been gifted with by the Holy Spirit and inspire you to nurture those communal instincts all the more. In other words, I think if we take some time with me preaching on it, all of us praying on it, and as many as possible being in small groups, we're, we're going to really, really get it even more and, and allow that, that sense of excitement and enthusiasm and, and com community to, to spread to more people who just come through our doors on a visit here and there. So I wanted to, to inspire us to more community. And the second thing I'm hoping this will do is it will help this congregation be more intentional about creating and nurturing and sustaining community within this congregation especially through small group growth and fellowship. I've said this before, but as we grow, all those places where we get 
face-to-face -face connection and we learn about your, your hopes and dreams and your passions and your, your prayers of blessing and your prayers of, of hurt. All those places where it's happening, like Christian Women's Fellowship and youth group and choir, they can only sustain so many people and, and, and they oftentimes are focused on this gift or that trait. We need more places where people can plug in right away, where there's always a seat, literally, around the circle. Oh, there's a seat for me. And I think small groups will help us to do that. And finally, finally, it will allow uh, the amazing things that are happening in the hearts and minds of those of us present at Franklin Circle Christian Church to connect to and maybe even shape the burgeoning community happening in our neighborhood and city. If you don't know what's happening in Ohio City or downtown, get a newspaper. Go online. That community is going to, going to explode. And I believe if we are out there sharing the kind of understanding that we have as Christians and as members of this church, we'll help that growth be grounded in something deeper than just commercial success or, or just uh, the thrill of being part of a new fad. I think we will be able to ground it in these Christian values that Philippians 2 and, and Christ talk about. So here's what I'm asking you to commit to, and I am asking you all to commit, even visitors here for the first time. <laughs> thought you could get out of this. I'm asking... Oh, this is my little picture of us connecting with our community. Uh, the first thing I am asking is to remember there are weekly sermons I'm going to preach. I'm going to try and work really hard on these sermons. I hope like I always do. Um, and talk about how we fulfill each of God's purposes better in our lives. There. We're actually more effective together as a group than we are as individuals. But I don't want you just to hear my sermons. I'm glad they're on YouTube. I'm glad if you're not here on a Sunday, you can go check them out. I want you to hear them in community because there's something different that happens when you hear the Word of God read and uh, reflected on in community. So as often as you can, come to worship. Second, these small groups I'm talking about. Um, as you go out today, I've already mentioned, Caroline's going to be there. Um, you're going to have a board. Sign your own name up. Find the day and time that works best for you. Um, and if none of them work, let me know if you're interested in starting one. A week from today, we'll have the first one start. We're going to spend this week getting those groups as full as possible. Um, they'll also be posted on our website, and I'll also be sending out a mass email so everybody can find out about these small groups. You can call me, text me, email me, Facebook message me, Twitter me uh, with the, the group that you want to join. No group will be too big because they're designed to expand. I'm only asking six weeks of your lives to help transform you, our church, and this neighborhood. Can you give me that, please? And third, these daily devotionals. It's all about what on earth are we here for? It's out of the work of Rick Warren, and I know not everybody is a Rick Warren fan. I think this is some of his best work. Uh, and I like it because it balances his passion for individual purposes in life and what God calls each of us as individuals and how that fits into community. I think it's the best of all possible worlds. It's a great little devotional book. It's free. We've been gifted by uh, Richard Hinkleman's congregation in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, all you have to do is pick one up and, and sign your name so I know who has one. Uh, particularly if you're going to be a part of a small group, grab one. But everybody who wants one can have one. And Caroline will be out. Um, and we'll have it available as often as possible in as many places as possible. And... This is where I'll end. The final thing, which is very unique to this program, is we're going to serve the community. We're going to be doing local outreach projects. Some of them are on a small scale. Each of the small groups will pick something manageable, something that they can bite off and, and, and work on, that they want to do out in the world that serves God's people. 
It's not spreading our name. It's not about trying to publicize Franklin Circle. It's really about serving God's people. And then and all these groups will report back on November 4th, the final day of the campaign, when we've got a big dinner plan. And each group will say, this is what we did out in the community to serve God's people. And on November 4th, we will have decided as a community a big service project that the whole congregation will do beyond these walls. It's, it's not doing one of the great service things we've already got, like our clothing room our weekend youth program, or even our meal program. Something bigger than that out in the world. We'll initiate it on November 4th. Um, and my hope is that we'll show Cleveland, Ohio, Northeast Ohio, how much Franklin Circle Christian Church loves this community as it always has. And that would be the best word to end on. Love. Love is why Christ calls us into community. It's why Christ lived community intentionally, sacrificially, and completely. Love is why this congregation exists. The love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the love of neighbor. And it's why you all come, whenever you can, to share yourselves in so many different ways. Because you love one another and you love God. I recognize that, and I honor and respect that. Whether you are attending youth group or adult Sunday school, whether you're serving in the third Sunday meal program, or you bring food to a memorial service of a beloved member, whether you bake bread or shortbread for Advent or Lenten organ concerts, or whether you just happen through the door one day and watched, you do it because you love. It's why we gather in community. So let us be sure to love and let our love shine like, like a candle in the darkness, like a city on the hill, like a Savior on the cross. May it be so.